Chapter 8, Section 3. What other forms did state intervention in creating capitalism take? Beyond being a paymaster for new forms of production and social relations and defending the owner's power, the state intervened economically as well. The state played a key role in transforming the law codes of society in a capitalistic fashion, ignoring custom and common law to do so. Similarly, the use of tariffs and the granting of monopolies to companies placed in, uh, played an important role in accumulating capital at the expense of working people, as did the breaking of unions and strikes by force. However, one of the most blatant of these acts was the enclosure of common land. In Britain, by means of the Enclosure Acts, land that had been freely used by poor peasants for farming their small family plots was claimed by large landlords as private property. As E.P. Thompson notes, quote, Parliament and law impose capitalist definitions to, uh, to exclusive property and land. See Customs in Common, page 163. Property rights, which exclusively flavor, favored the rich, replaced the use rights and free agreement that had governed peasants' use of the commons. Unlike use rights, which rest in the individual, property rights require state intervention to create and maintain. The stealing of the land should not be underestimated. Without land, you cannot live and have to sell your liberty to others. This places those with capital at an advantage, which will tend to increase rather than decrease the inequalities in society and so place the landless workers at an increasing disadvantage over time. This process can be seen from early stages of capitalism with the enclosure of land, an agricultural workforce was created which had to travel where the work was. This influx of landless ex-peasants into the towns ensured the traditional guild system crumbled and was transformed into capitalistic industry with bosses and wage slaves rather than master craftsmen and their journeymen. Hence, the enclosure of land played a key role for, quote, It is clear that economic inequalities are unlikely to create a division of society into employing master class and a subject wage earning class unless access to the man's, produ uh, man's of production, means of production, including land, is by some means or another barred to a substantial section of the community. Maurice Dobbs studies in, in Capitalistic Development, page 253. The importance of access to land is summarized by this limerick by the followers of Henry George, a 19th century writer who argued for a single tax in the nationalization of land. The Georgites got their basic argument on the importance of land down these few excellent lines. A college economist planned to live without access to land. He would have succeeded but found that he needed food, shelter, and somewhere to stand. Thus, the individualist and other anarchist concern over the land monopoly, of which the Enclosures Act were but one part. The land monopoly, to use Tucker's words, quote, consists in the enforcement of government land titles which do not rest upon personal occupancy and cultivation. The Anarchist Reader, page 150. It's important to remember that wage labor first developed on the land, and it was the protection of land titles of landlords and nobility combined with enclosure that meant people could not work their own land. In other words, the circumstances so created by enclosing the land and enforcing property rights to large estates ensured that capitalists did not have to point a gun at workers' head to get them to work long hours in authoritarian, dehumanizing conditions. In such circumstances, when the majority are dispossessed and face the threat of starvation, poverty, homelessness, and so on, initiation of force is not required, but guns were required to enforce the system of private property that created the labor market in the first place, to enforce the enclosure of common land and protect the estates of the nobility and wealthy. In addition to increasing the availability of land on the market, the enclosures also had the effect of destroying working class independence. Through these acts, innumerable peasants were excluded from access to their former means of livelihood, forcing them to migrate to cities to seek work in the newly emerging factories of the budding capitalist class, who were thus provided with the ready source of cheap labor. The capitalists, of course, did not describe the results this way, but attempted to obfuscate the issue with their usual rhetoric about civilization and progress. Thus, John Bellers, a 17th century supporter of enclosures, claimed that the commons were a hindrance to industry and nurseries of idleness and insolence. The forests and great commons make the poor that are upon them too much like the Indians, quoted by Thompson. 
Um, elsewhere, Thompson argued that the commons were now seen as a dangerous center of indiscipline. Ideology was added to self-interest. It became a matter of public spirited policy for gentlemen to remove cottagers from the commons, reduce his laborers to dependence, making of the English working class, pages 242 to 243. Um, the commons gave working class people a degree of independence which allowed them to be insolent to their betters. This had to be stopped as it undermined to the very roots of authority relationships within society. The commons increased freedom for ordinary people and made, uh, made them less willing to follow orders and accept wage labor. The reference to Indians is important as the independence and native of, uh, freedom of Native Americans is well documented. The common feature of both cultures was communal ownership of the means of production and free access to it. As an early American economist, Edward Wakefield, noted in 1833, quote, where land is cheap and all are free, where everyone who so pleases can easily obtain a piece of land for himself, not only is labor dear, as respects the labor's share of the product, prof, uh, product, but the difficulty is to obtain combined labor at any price. England and America, quoted by Jeremy Breacher and Tim Costello, Common Sense for Hard Times, page 24. The enclosure of the commons in whatever form it took solved both problems. The high cost of labor and the freedom and dignity of the worker, the enclosures perfectly illustrate the principle that capitalism requires a state to ensure that the majority of people do not have free access to any means of livelihood and so must sell themselves to capitalists in order to survive. There is no doubt that if the state had left alone the European peasantry, allowing them to continue their collective farming practices, collective farming, because as Kropotkin shows in Mutual Aid, the peasants not only shared the land, but much of the farm labor as well, capitalism could not have taken hold. See Mutual Aid, and Mutual Aid pages 184 to 189 for more on European enclosures. As Kropotkin notes, instances of commoners themselves dividing the, uh, their lands were rare. Everywhere the state coerced them to enforce the division or simply favored the private appropriation of their lands by the nobles and wealthy. Mutual aid, page 188. Thus, Kropokin's statement that to speak to the natural death of the village community or of the commons in virtue of economical law is as grim a joke as to speak to the, of the natural death of soldiers slaughtered on a battlefield. Mutual aid, page 189. Like the more, rec more recent case of fascist Chile, Free market capitalism was imposed on the majority of society by an elite using an authoritarian state. This was recognized by Adam Smith when he opposed state intervention in the wealth of nations. In Smith's day, the government was openly and unashamedly an instrument of wealth owners. Less than 10% of British men, and no women, had the right to vote. When Smith opposed state interference, he was opposing the imposition of wealth owners' interests on everybody else. And of course, how liberal, never mind libertarian, is a political system in which the many follow the rules and laws set down by the so-called interests of only a few. As history shows, any minority given or who take such power will abuse it in their own interests. Today, the situation is reversed with neoliberals and right libertarians opposing state interference in the economy, example, regulation of big business, so as to prevent the public from having even a minor impact on the power or interests of the elite. The fact that free market capitalism always requires introduction by an authoritarian state should make all honest libertarians ask, how free is the free market? And why, when it is introduced, do the rich get richer and the poor poorer? This was the case in Chile. For the poverty associated with the rise of capitalism in England 200 years ago, E.P. Thompson's The Making